Welcome, and thank you for joining us here today. My name is Phil Murdoch. I'm one of the audit partners here at uh, BDO in Perth and also currently the, the Head of Audit and Assurance for WA, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's session. Today we'll be hosting our annual 30 June financial reporting update, but before we be begin proceedings, I would like to acknowledge that we are hosting this meeting on the traditional lands of the Noongar people. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and elders both past and present. So you'd be pleased to know that after a couple of years of presenting a significant amount of technical content in the lead up to ISB 15, 9 and 16, today's session will be somewhat more practical with our BDO team covering a broad range of topics including running you through some new accounting developments, some accounting or common accounting issues we're seeing in practice. Um, some of those relate to the post-implementation issues uh, relating to ISB 16 and 15. And we'll also take you through ASIC surveillance and areas of focus as we head into 30 June. We'll also share some common business themes that we are seeing in ESG and risk management. Uh, which, as we know, are receiving increasing shareholder and stakeholder interest. Today's session will be hosted by Ashley Woodley, a partner in, in our IFRS advisory team. Ash will be supported by Kay Kelly, who is also a, in our IFRS advisory team as an associate director. Uh, and joining the both of the IFRS advisory team members will be Jane Gouvernay, who is our associate director in our advisory team and Jane specialises in corporate governance and regulation. And Jane will talk us through what she's seeing in governance, risk management and ESG. Um, so I'd like, now like to pass you over to Ashley um, to, to get today's session underway. Um, and we thank you all for your attendance once again. Thanks, Phil, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. As Phil mentioned, myself and Jane will be presenting today and. Kay is watching the chat box to respond to any queries that come through. So please make use of that as we go along this morning. On the screen, um, on this slide is today's agenda. And as you can see, we have a lot of topics that we wanted to address. So I thought it would be good to quickly run a poll to get everyone's views on what is most relevant as we head into 30 June. So if you can just answer the poll that's on your screen, um, <laughs> whether you're interested in ESG, which as Phil mentioned is a hot topic lately and you may be wondering how it will impact your business and your reporting requirements. Um, there's also the recent developments, um, the common issues that we're seeing across the older accounting standards, um, including WASB 15, share-based payment modifications, refinancing, leases or impairment, or the final option is the future transitioning from special purpose to general purpose. So I'll just give everyone a few, a couple more minutes to answer the poll question. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. We've got a good response rate. So I'll just share the results. Um, and as you can see, quite a bit of interest around recent developments, common accounting issues and transitioning from special purpose to general purpose, um, which uh, is where we're actually seeing a lot of work at the moment. So it's not surprising that these three are most relevant for today. So I will make sure that I have enough time to go through each of these sections. But if there's anything as we're going along that I haven't addressed, please feel free to use the chat box and Kay can respond or we can um, respond following the webinar today. So. First up, I will hand over to Jane and she will give an update on um, sustainability reporting. Thanks, Ash. Um, we can probably go to the next slide now. 
Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about ESG. Uh, ESG has certainly, and the whole concept environmental social governance has, has been around for, for a long time. And the concept itself is not new, and there's always, there's been discussions about introduction into the um, ASX corporate governance principles, and there's been um, increasing discussion around climate change and its relevance to ESG and disclosure around that. So it's really not new, but it is becoming very quickly um, one of our newest emerging risks. There's no clear statutory requirement to report against ESG in Australia, but this is becoming increasingly dif dis different in other countries, particularly um, Hong Kong and um, most particularly uh, Europe. So these are placing um, increased pressure on us as long as, along with the climate uh, change discussion um, on us as in terms of Australia to start to look at climate change, um, corporate social responsibility, and how our corporate entities are um, addressing that in their own organisations. It's becoming more of an emerging risk because we've seen some recent examples where pressure has resulted in um, disruption to um, what would normally be um, a, for example, um, AGM with Woodside when there was um, remuneration resolutions um, put by shareholders asking to report against ESG and, and also um, director uh, remuneration against ESG. And also we've seen the big bash, backlash on social responsibility for Rio and the um, Duke and Gorge. So it's certainly becoming uh, a more discussed topic and more pressure on our corporate entities uh, to respond. If I could go to the next slide. Thanks, Ash. Um, this escalating pressure is coming from multiple sources. So certainly um, uh, it's increased, particularly over the past 12 months, um, maybe two years. So it's coming firstly from Australia and global regulators and the press on um, climate change and reporting against climate change, and in particular, incorporating it into our uh, risk-related disclosure. And of course, risk-related disclosure has to have some support through your own internal risk management processes. We're also seeing, particularly in Europe, but we're starting to see it in Australia, increased pressure from private equity and institutional investors who are looking to attract our newest investors uh, who are younger, the millennial and the younger generations, who are really socially conscious uh, on their investment choices. And they're starting to make large investment choices um, as time progresses and starting to, to demand more ethical um, investments. There's also concern and a more immediate concern um, over the exposure of individual directors and executives to this whole potential of shareholder act activism against ESG and reporting against it about how the company and also its supply chain are managing their climate change and social responsibilities. Uh, next one please. Thank you. So you can see um, it's becoming uh, an issue that is beyond the standard material risks. It's broadening way more beyond that and becoming far more complex. And the pressure to address climate change and also our pandemic and rising industrialization is coming from multiple sources. Uh, I think Australia is in a very good position at the moment because we, we can see what's been happening in Europe um, and also in places like Hong Kong in terms of reporting and um, assessment. Next one, please. Thank you. Um, this whole pressure isn't new or, or, or it, it, it's similar, I think, or you can um, give it some similarity or there's an analogy with what happened with remuneration reporting. When you look back in 2008, post GFC um, and the years after that, there was concern publicly about the alignment of remuneration and um, uh, performance. 
So what ended up happening is that pressure increased, it increased from regulators, expectations around disclosure tool, it was considered that the response wasn't um, swift enough and of course it was introduced into our legislation and reporting particularly in the annual report and the remuneration report um, became a statutory requirement. This of course was dictated by the government, government at the time and pressure from the government at the time and this may very well be the case with um, ESG reporting. So we spoke about, or I mentioned it's beyond our typical framework. So our typical framework currently is you'll have a, polic a policy, a methodology, um, an appetite statement and an organisational risk register, which will then filter through the organisation in terms of um, division risks and business unit risks. Originally when risk management became um, a framework to follow within organisations. It was very much based around financial reporting. It then developed and certainly the Banking Royal Commission saw reasons for it to develop beyond that financial to non-financial reporting. And I can see now that this non-financial is going to increase to ESG reporting as well. Next slide, please. So this is an example of what our regulator, our current regulator is doing and then the analogy once again can be made to remuneration where regulators came out post GFC saying we need to see some alignment between performance and director remuneration. So currently they're asking directors to consider climate risk as, as part of their risk management process. Um, and also to develop a stronger framework around um, ESG governance, particularly in terms of oversight management and increasingly reporting. Uh, they're asking that and, and there is an expectation that ESG is actually covered under some of the disclosure requirements under the law and certainly around fundraising, continuous disclosure and risk disclosure, climate change is becoming um, increasingly more required. And uh, the regulator ASIC is uh, looking at disclosure against the task force for climate related financial disclosure. So that you can use um, in your own situation as a principle based disclosure expectation and one that um, is likely to infiltrate into Australia in the very near future um, in terms of a, a requirement rather than a um, voluntary um, recommendation or guideline. Next slide please. So this is BDO's roadmap and we've got this roadmap here so you can um, assess yourself against where you are in this whole ESG framework and uh, journey I guess. Uh, certainly European countries and possibly even Hong Kong is probably at the later end strategic um, integration and purpose driven and this is because there are uh, greater pressures and it's some country statutory requirements for this type of disclosure. So the first one is where do I start? So there's no management consideration, um, disclosure is um, brief and boilerplate and sustainability reporting um, is not supported or common. Then you can go to can you certify your sustainability reporting. So this is looking at you've actually engaged with the process and you'd like um, to improve the reporting and reach uh, a level of, of um, certification. So can you investigate sustainability issues is the next. So is that part of your normal course of risk management, um, monitoring, processing, um, investigations? Then there's the value creation and that's where you really start to turn your mind to our future strategies and the way that the organisation can address DSG and this may include um, uh, requirements of supply chain and uh, tendering as part of uh, ESG as being part of it, the tendering process. And the last is impacting business. So this is really the more um, advanced where you actually measure and have a good idea of how it un impacts your business. It's very much part of your business model and you may be transforming areas of your organisations to um, a more sustainable framework. So we're just going to go to a um, 
quiz now uh, to if we could get that up to give you the op opportunity to really um, assess yourself well where are you and uh, give you some idea where your colleagues also are in this process and then you can start to think about possibly bringing this to your board or to your executive to think about um, integration within your own organisation. So we have up here a quick poll and um, Ash, I'll leave it to you to let me know when there's sufficient response on that. Yes, thanks, Jane. We're um, up around 40% at the moment, so I'll just give it a few more seconds to let a few more people vote. Okay, so I'm going to close it off. And I'm just sharing the results now. Okay, thanks Ash. Um, no integration. That's not uncommon at the moment in Australia. It would be very uncommon in uh, Europe um, and some other countries who are really embracing um, ESG. So that gives you an idea at least of, of um, where you are in the journey, where others, there's some at full integration. Um, generally in Australia, we have our larger um, top 200 entities that may be uh, reaching partial and full integration, but certainly it gives you an idea of, of what may lay ahead for you. Uh, Thanks, Ash. We can go to the next one. Um, just to mention here also at BDO, we have um, clean energy um, auditors. We have two on board here, Phil Murdoch, who spoke and introduced this particular session, and also Glenn O'Brien. They're actually um, authorised or uh, certified under two categories, and we have very few of those um, in Perth, I think we have about three or four people that are categorised um, under two categories or authorised under two categories. I think we have nine altogether in Western Australia. But certainly if um, you're looking at those sorts of um, ESG um, auditing requirements, uh, Phil and Glyn are those to contact. Uh, I'll leave it at there, I think. Um, Thanks, Ash, but certainly just to say, um, it's a good idea to start looking at ESG in your organisation now so that if things do change fairly quickly, you're certainly not um, caught off guard in the future. Thanks, Ash. Great, thanks, Jane. Um, a very relevant update. And as you highlighted, ESG is commanding more and more attention from various stakeholders and with boards, so it is critical to keep up to date with this topic. Uh, moving along now to some tax insights following the recent federal budget. And I wanted to bring to your attention two of the most relevant points. So firstly, we have lost carry back provisions where the government has announced an extension to the temporary loss carryback rules announced in the 2020 federal budget. So this extension will allow eligible companies to carry back and use tax losses from the 2023 income year to offset tax paid on profits from the 2019 and subsequent income years and effectively receive a refund of income tax paid in previous years. So if an entity elects to use the loss carryback provisions, adjustments need to be made to reflect the tax refund rather than showing it as a deferred tax asset to be recovered by a reduction in future income tax payable. So I've just got the accounting entry that would be expected um, in the green box on this slide. The second point um, in relation to tax is that the government has also announced a 12 month extension to the instant asset write off measures until 30 June 2023. These measures provide eligible businesses with an immediate deduction for the full cost of depreciating assets or assets acquired after the 6th of October and in use by 30 June 2022. 
I've included on this slide the contact details of our local tax experts. So if you have any queries or need any assistance on any tax related matters, please reach out to any one of these. Moving along now to the latest developments. And the first one being the amendments to AASB3. So um, this was addressed in our webinar in November, but um, I just wanted to highlight a few of the changes um, and address some of the queries that we're starting to see. So a reminder of the AASB3 amendments. Um, in summary, the amended definition of a business has a narrower definition of outputs and the new definition includes the concept of a substantive process. In order to be considered a business, an acquired set of activities and assets must include as a minimum an input and a substantive process. The amendments also introduce an optional concentration test as a shortcut to concluding that certain types of acquisitions are not business combinations. <clears throat> so this third amendment clarifies that to be considered a business, an acquired set of activities and assets must include as a minimum an input and a substantive process that together significantly contribute to the ability to create outputs. So to just go over that again, so there needs to be an input which can be technology, non-current assets, intellectual property, in process, R&D, employees, etc and also a substantive process, for example, strategic management processes and operational pro processes, which are typically documented. So you need both of these together to create outputs and then you have a business. To break this down into how you would step through the process, I'll just quickly run through an example. <clears throat> so the relevant facts are included on this slide. Um, we're assuming MBL purchases Small Vaccine Researcher Co. Um, I'll just call that Small Co going forward. So the operations of Small Co include in-process research and development of various vaccines, scientists and other clinical staff with the knowledge and necessary skills to perform the R&D activities, as well as management staff with experience in operating a biotech. And Small Co also has various plant and equipment. <clears throat> the question is, has MBL acquired any processes when it purchases small, small co? So we're not concluding yet whether it's a business combination, just looking at the first stage to see if processes have been acquired. <clears throat> and we've got three options on the slide. Um, option one, no, not a, no processes as they don't have any documented operational or strategic management processes in place. Option two is yes, processes have been acquired given the organised workforce. <clears throat> and option three, um, also no, as Smallco does not have any revenue. <clears throat> so in this case, option two is correct. Based on the background information, while the management of Smallco did not have any documented processes, the acquired workforce of both scientific staff and other management does have the necessary skills, knowledge and experience of Small Co's ongoing project in order to continue with them. It is this intellectual capacity that has been acquired in the workforce that may provide the necessary processes that are capable of being applied to inputs to create outputs. <clears throat> so now that we've determined that processes have been acquired, the next step is to determine whether the processes are substantive. The new amendments, um, there's extensive guidance as part of these amendments to assist in determining whether, whether an acquired process is substantive. And there are different requirements to run through depending on whether the acquiry has outputs on acquisition date. So firstly, if a set of activities and assets do not have outputs, an acquired process is only considered substantive if it is critical to the ability of the entity to develop or convert an acquired input into outputs and the inputs acquired include both an organised workforce that has the skills, knowledge or experience to perform that process 
as well as other inputs that the organised workforce could develop and convert into outputs. So for example, there also needs to be intellectual property that could be used to develop a good or service, other economic resources that could be developed to create outputs or rights to obtain access to necessary materials or rights that enable the creation of future outputs. <clears throat> this means that there would be no substantive process and therefore no business where an enti entity acquired a process with inputs but a workforce that is not sufficiently skilled or a process and a skilled workforce but no other inputs to develop and convert into outputs. <clears throat> Contrasting this to when a set of activities and assets does have outputs at acquisition date, so an acquired process is only considered to be substantive if when applied to an acquired input it is critical to the entity's ability to continue producing outputs and the inputs acquired include an organised workforce that has the skills, knowledge or experience to perform that process or significantly contributes to the ability to continue producing outputs and is considered unique or cannot be replaced without significant cost, effort or delay in the ability to continue producing outputs. So two different approaches to consider when the acquiry does have outputs. Now if we apply this to our example, so going back to the original facts where MBL purchases small co, um, MBL notes that small co currently does not have any outputs as it's an early stage research development entity that has not completed development on any of its vaccines and it therefore does not have any outputs. In this example we have already established that the acquisition includes processes which are small co's organised workforce which consists of highly skilled scientific staff and management that have the necessary skills and experience following rules and conventions that may provide the necessary processes that are capable of being applied to inputs to create outputs. <clears throat> we now need to consider whether this acquired process is a substantive process. So MBL would look at the guidance in paragraph B12B, which was the first flowchart, because Smallco does not have any outputs at the date of acquisition. So this is the relevant flowchart um, and working through this we need to ask if the processes are critical to the ability of the entity to develop or convert an acquired input into outputs. <clears throat> Have we acquired an organised workforce that has the skills, knowledge or experience to perform that process and finally if other inputs have also been acquired. <clears throat> So has MBL acquired a substantive process? And for this example, the answer is yes. Um, MBL has acquired a substantive process as all these elements were acquired with the in-process R&D being the other inputs acquired along with the workforce. Moving on now to the optional concentration test um, with the emphasis on the optional part, meaning that it's not mandatory. Entities can choose for each account, for each acquisition, whether they want to apply the optional test or not. <clears throat> it's only worth going down this track if the entity has purchased assets where it appears that the majority of the fair value of the gross assets is concentrated in a single asset. So where more than one thing has been acquired, it's unlikely the optional concentration test will be met. If substantially all of the fair value of the gross assets acquired are concentrated in a single identifiable asset or group of similar identifiable assets, the acquirer can choose to either <coughs> apply the optional concentration test and recognise the acquisition as an asset acquisition without performing a detailed assessment of whether there is a business combination or not or to perform the detailed assessment of whether there is a business combination. So to clarify, it may turn out that there, there is a business combination and AASB3 is applied, or it may turn out that there is no business combination and the acquisition is treated as an asset acquisition anyway, 
even though the shortcut method of getting to an asset acquisition failed. The key question we're seeing with clients wanting to apply the optional concentration test is how to determine if assets can be grouped together as a group of similar assets. So to answer this, we need to consider the nature of each asset and the risks associated with managing and creating outputs from the assets. In AASB3, um, it specifies that certain assets cannot be grouped together as similar assets, and these are detailed on the slide. <clears throat> so that concludes the section on AASB3 amendments. But, um, Ash, can I, can I, oh, sorry, sorry Ash, yep. can, can I just interrupt with a question that has come through um, and give you a chance to have a little break and a sip of water maybe. Um, a question that's come through is if we've got no outputs, then if we've got no employees, can we have an organised workforce? Um, and whilst generally I think you'd say if you've got no employees, you probably haven't got an organised workforce, we have seen situations where where there is actually an organised workforce. For example, um, if you've got a joint operation, um, so and you're the um, non-operating partner, you may not have any employees, but because you've got a partnership agreement with the the operator of the joint venture, or an agreement with the operator of the joint venture, effectively you have a an organised workforce through through that agreement, through that contract. So generally, I would say probably if there's no employees, there won't be an organised workforce, but you do need to take care as to whether you actually do have an organised workforce through through contract in in some situations. So hopefully that clarifies that one. Answers that question. Great, thanks, Kay, and thank you for um, the person raising the question. It was a great time. I'm suffering from a cold, so um, yes, I did need a, a break from talking. So apologies going forward if I start coughing. Um, please just bear with me. Okay, so um, yes, you'll be pleased to know that SubLase V3 was the only new accounting standard change that's mandatory for 30 June 2021 reports. Um, the next three topics are very recent issues that are continuing to evolve and we're seeing that they are impacting a variety of different businesses. So the first one is remuneration under payments. So not a change in any accounting standard, um, but a big focus in the last few years with underpayment of wages um, becoming a pressing issue in the Australian economy in particular. So the AASB has released a staff FAQ to remind entities of the accounting standards that may be applicable when accounting for the underpayments. We're seeing a lot of work in this area, as we know that all the various awards are very difficult um, to navigate through and there is a lot of risk involved. So I just wanted to highlight to everyone to make sure systems and processes are in place um, and to look at this FAQ if you think you may have this issue to determine the accounting implications. Linked to this is the employee entitlements for casual employees, which was a big deal last year following the Rosato case. This year it is still a big deal um, as there's talk of an appeal and what would happen on appeal. There's also new legislation and whether the new legislation which appears to come to a different conclusion um, and how that legislation will need to be applied. There are some entities that recognise a provision for underpayment of casual employees, and these might, depending on your specific facts and circumstances, um, and it's strongly recommended that legal advice is obtained, but for some entities, you might now be able to reverse these positions under the new legislation. So the answer is not yet clear, um, but this is more of a watch and see, and we'll keep you updated on any further decisions and developments through our video newsletters and other communications. A very recent issue is around software as a service arrangements. 
So this is following an agenda decision by the IFRIC in April and is moving very rapidly. What this is, is an interpretation that clarifies that costs that are capitalised that actually relate to software that is owned and controlled by someone else um, may actually need to be expensed. So the question is, do you have capitalised costs that relate to configuration customization costs for software that is controlled by a third party? And if the answer is yes, then treatment of these costs will need to be looked at. And if these costs need to be written off, will this be done retrospectively or in the current period? As I mentioned, this is a very recent issue that is evolving, but does need to be dealt with prior to 30 June. So please reach out if you have intangible assets that may be impacted. And the final topic for recent developments is going concern. As you can imagine, accounting standard setting bodies globally are paying close attention to the requirements around going concern, basis of preparation and the related disclosures. So going through this flow chart, if you have material uncertainties around going concern, you will likely end up in the yellow or blue boxes of the flow chart. And the expectation is that clear disclosures are required addressing the judgments made and uncertainties faced in regards to the going concern assessment. The publication linked on this slide um, explains the disclosures required and was released following an update from the IFRS Foundation with an aim of reducing the divergence in disclosures across different entities. So on to our next topic, which is ASIC focus areas and FAQs. <laughs> Just last month, ASIC has given us an extension of reporting deadlines um, applicable for many entities. So the reason for the extension being granted is mainly due to resource constraints, constraints across accounting firms nationally, um, which is why the extension only applies to entities with year ends in the peak period. So any entity with reporting dates from the 23rd of June 2021 to the 7th of July 2021. Um, also please note the second point on this slide that this relief is not available for foreign registered companies as these companies do not fall into either Chapter 2M or Chapter 7 of the Corps Act. Another change by ASIC is that right of use assets will be able to be included in the AFSL um, net asset value and surplus liquid funds calculations. And I've also included a link to the ASIC Frequently Asked Questions page, which includes various staff FAQs, which can be useful resources when you want to see um, ASIC expectations or if you have queries on certain matters um, and want to see how ASIC's viewpoint on those issues. And the final ASIC related point is the recent ASIC enforcements um, and it's unsurprising to see impairment at the top of the table once again with seven recent enforcements following the ASIC surveillance program. So now looking at impairment testing, um, so it's consistently at the top of ASIC's radar because of the complexities involved. So I wanted to discuss or highlight a few reminders around impairment testing and um, highlight some things to look out for when undertaking your assessments for this reporting season. <clears throat> so firstly, when preparing the impairment calculations, just a reminder that the recoverable amount is the higher of fair value or value in use. Um, so it's not a choice whether which one you use, you have the recoverable amount must be the higher of fair value or value in use. So fair value is a market-based measure, whereas value in use is an entity specific measure. This slide explains the different measurement approaches and the impact of COVID-19 on each approach. Um, value and use calculations will always require a discount rate to be used and if, if you're doing the fair value method um, and you're using a 
discounted cash flow model, then discount rate considerations will be applicable to both. And it's the discount rate that we are seeing is most impacted by COVID, so will be something to address for this year's impairment testing as well. In regards to timing of impairment tests, it's important to remember that not only is an impairment assessment required annually for goodwill and any indefinite life intangibles, but impairment testing is also required for all assets if there are any indicators of impairment. Indicators of impairment can include declines in quoted asset values, operational disruptions to supply chains and decreases in revenue and profitability. This slide is probably the most relevant one that I wanted to address today, as it highlights the common issues or concerns around impairment testing that we are seeing. <clears throat> so most entities are preparing five-year discounted cash flow models for their impairment testing, and we're already seeing many impairment models that are using a V-curve approach. Um, so while it does seem that the Australian economy has fared well, this is a reminder that we are still in the height of a global pandemic. There's still border closures and the government stimulus measures are starting to wind back. So for Australia, the second quarter results have not yet come out. Um, so we're not sure yet of the effects that the end of JobKeeper um, will have on the economy. So it may not yet be appropriate to use a V-curve model for cash flow forecasting and perhaps a U-curve or potentially a W-curve is more appropriate. Um, so as impairment testing is very complex and judgmental, um, and like I said, it's once again a focus area for ASIC, we've developed some publications to assist you in your assessments and the links for these are on the next couple of slides. So the next session um, is the common accounting issues, which was um, the one that had the most interest following the poll that we did first up. So I'll just spend a bit of time um, going through these different issues that we're currently being faced with. Um, and the main thing we are seeing is when there's modifications to contracts. So the most common is around share-based payment modifications and leases, but we're also starting to see modifications to loans and also modifications with customer contracts. So firstly, to look at revenue. Um, as I said, we're getting regular inquiries from clients with regards to AASB 15, and the current biggest issue is where customer contracts are modified. The requirements of AASB 15 are that contract modifications can only be accounted for as a separate contract to the original one when the scope of the contract changes due to additional promised goods or services that are distinct and the increase in the price is reflective of the standalone selling price of the additional goods or services. So two conditions are required to be able to say that the new contract with an existing customer or a contract modification is a separate contract. What we are seeing is that this is a very rare situation where both these conditions are met. And so it's unlikely that contract modifications would be treated as separate contracts. When we start to modify contracts with customers, it tends to not be adding something plus paying fair value. Usually discounts are given or the scope of services are reduced. So where we have contract modifications that are not separate contracts, the modification can be treated as a termination where there's no adjustment to revenue recognised to date, or it could be treated as a continuation which will have a revenue adjustment, or it could be a mixture of both. So contract modifications are a very complex part of AASB 15 um, and if you're modifying any contracts or entering into contracts with existing clients um, new, and you need any guidance, please reach out and we'll be happy to guide you through the process. 
Turning now to lease accounting, which is still probably the most complained about standard. Um, and the visual on this screen probably explains why we get a lot of complaints on this. Um, so this talks through the ongoing management of the Blaze B16. And as you can see, there are many considerations needed with the ongoing management of leases. For example, you need to consider what's the difference between a new lease and a modification or extension of an existing lease. Are you accounting for COVID-19 rent concessions? How are you determining the discount rate for a modification or new lease? Are you aware that the discount rate changes if you reassess the lease term? And for all these questions, do you know when to expect a P&L impact? When do you have to adjust your discount rate or when the changes impact the lease liability and right of use asset by the same amount? In the COVID environment, we're seeing a lot of lease modifications, um, mainly a reduction in lease premises as more flexible working arrangements are adopted. And again, again, the accounting for these are complex. There's also the COVID-19 related rent concessions, which has just had a recent change. Um, just last month, the IASB said that if you get a reduction in lease payments for payments originally due on or before 30 June 2022, not just 30 June 2021, then you can still apply this practical expedient. So the date in criteria three has been changed. It's no longer payments to 30 June 2021, but it has been extended to 30 June 2022. And this is explained in the publication linked on this slide. Um, and this includes worked examples and whether retrospective application is required for rent concessions that went beyond this date and therefore initially would not have met the criteria for this practical expedient. This slide includes links for further information on the BDO lease management services, which are becoming increasingly popular um, as the pain and complexity of lease accounting is increasing and people are realising that Excel is maybe not working for them. And I just wanted to take a moment here to get your views on AASB 16 and how you anticipate the impact lease accounting will have on your next reporting season. So I'm just going to run a poll, uh, which should be on your screen now. Um, so post implementation of AASB 16, how do you anticipate the impact of lease accounting on your next reporting period? I'll just let it run a little bit longer. Um, so the options, no impact as you don't have any leases, you're not expecting any issues. Some issues may be expected um, or you're expecting that it'll be painful. Okay, I'm going to close the poll in two seconds. Okay, thank you for everyone who voted. Um, the results should be shared on the screen. Um, and the majority are not expecting any issues, which is pleasing to see that a lot of you are on top of your lease management. Um, however, there is still quite a few um, who are expecting some issues who maybe perhaps have not looked at their lease models since last reporting season. And there's also a few that think that it'll be painful. Um, and this is a common view I'm hearing when speaking with clients. So if you're looking for solutions to alleviate this burden, please reach out and we can assist either with full lease management services or performing assessments of new lease arrangements. Okay, so moving on to share-based payments. Um, as everyone would know, we have staff shortages in many industries across the state. Entities are starting to think about how do we retain our staff? 
and many are looking at amending their share-based payment arrangements. So whether it be increasing service conditions but countering it with a lower exercise price or reducing the performance conditions of arrangements, any modification to a share-based payment causes great issues in the application as the share-based payment standard AASB2 contains a lot of complexity and there's different outcomes depending on original what the original conditions were, how they've been amended um, and whether they were non-market or market-based conditions. We're also seeing a lot of replacement awards where entities are attempting to incentivise staff by, for example, reducing unachievable market conditions. <laughs> but mistakes in the application are being made, which can result in accelerated vesting, meaning increased share-based payment expense on the date of modification. So if it's not too late and you are considering modifying your share-based payment arrangements, it's a good idea to reach out to us or your auditor to understand the accounting implications before you commit to any changes. And the final area on this section is modification to financial instruments. Again, another standard where there are very specific rules and this is WASB 9, um, which has specific rules on how to account for a modification to a loan. So whether this is a change in repayment terms, interest rate or maturity date, these are all modifications that need to be assessed. If the change in cash flow of the new arrangement compared to the carrying amount of the existing liability is greater than 10%, then this is a substantial modification, which means you do recognise the existing liability and recognise a new liability using an updated discount rate. If the modification is non-substantial, you just adjust the carrying amount of the existing liability and any fees any fees incurred are included in the new carrying amount and amortised over the remaining term. So as you can see, whether the modification is substantial or non-substantial non can have very vast impacts on your P&L. Another modification we are seeing are when financial liabilities are settled with equity instruments when this wasn't in the original terms with the creditor. Um, so if RIC 19 addresses the accounting where an entity extinguishes a financial liability by issuing its own shares, and in summary, it's not a straightforward movement from liability to equity, there will be a P&L impact if the share issue is not done at the market price of shares on the date of settlement. And finally, on to convertible notes. Um, which we're seeing a lot of queries around in recent times. So this very complex looking diagram represents the complexity of convertible notes on a page. The initial assessment of convertible note arrangements is by itself very complex as you need to consider whether the instrument is debt, equity, a combination of both and or if there are any embedded derivatives. Just this initial assessment generally requires a lot of judgment and interpretation of the standards. And if you start modifying these arrangements, the accounting that follows is highly complex. BDO has a really great publication to assist you in making your way through this flowchart. Um, or of course, please contact us if assistance is needed. So now turning to the future of financial statements um, and the transition from special purpose to general purpose. From 1 July 2021, so just a couple of months away, the reporting entity concept will be removed. So from this date, any entities that have to prepare financial statements in accordance with Australian accounting standards must prepare general purpose financial statements. The yellow box is applicable for all entities that are required to report under the Corps Act. So for example, large PTY LTDs, AFSLs or foreign owned entities who don't have ASIC reporting relief. And remember, this is applicable for large subsidiaries within your groups. Um, these also need general purpose financial statements 
and we'll need to consolidate any entities that it, that the subsidiary controls. Um, whereas in the current state, if these entities were required to report to ASIC, typically they would only prepare special purpose standalone financials. The green box shows that even entities that do not have Corps Act reporting requirements, um, if the entity's constitution or a trust deed requires accounts be prepared in accordance with Australian accounting standards and the constitution or other documents are amended at any point after 1 July 2021 for any reason, these entities will now need general purpose financial statements. Sorry, Ash, can I just interrupt and just clarify what you just said? Um, if you've got a wholly owned subsidiary within a group, then it can be exempt from preparing consolidated financial statements at a subsidiary level if it's included in a, a set of group accounts that, uh, that are fully consolidated. Um, that, yeah. So if you're a large PTY within a group, and your parent is preparing consolidated financial statements that you're consolidated into, then there is an exemption from preparing from consolidation at that level, not necessarily from general purpose otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yes, great. Thank you, Kay. Okay, so um, looking at when to transition from special purpose to general purpose. Um, so in the current year, you can still do special purpose if you are not a reporting entity, um, but if you early adopt, there are transition relief options. And what is really important is how do you transition from special purpose to general purpose? <clears throat> so this slide shows the different pathways depending on whether you have controlled entities or not, and if you have previously applied all recognition and measurement requirements in the most recent financial statements. So following the flow chart, if you are a single entity with no controlled entities, you go to the left down the blue boxes. If all applicable recognition and measurement requirements were previously applied in the most recent special purpose financial statements, then all you have to worry about is additional disclosures. But if you didn't apply all recognition and measurement requirements, then on transition, you will need to adopt IFRS 1 or IAS 8 and also include all the additional disclosures required. If, however, you have controlled entities, you must consolidate. Again, if you previously consolidated and applied all recognition and, me and measurement requirements, then you just need to worry about the new disclosures. If you previously did not apply all the recognition and measurement requirements or did not consolidate, then you will need to apply IFRS 1 or IAS 8 on transition. And this slide um, discusses the differences between IFRS 1 and IAS 8. IS8 generally requires full retrospective application, whereas IFRS 1 was designed to give entities a fresh start using the international framework. For Tier 2 entities, there is a further practical expedient that allows the entity to use a route to IFRS without the need to present a restatement of comparative information. The different selection options, whether you go down IAS8 or IFRS 1, or which optional exemptions you take can result in very different outcomes. So it's definitely worth thinking about this sooner rather than later and potentially worth mapping out the different outcomes so you know the best pathway to take. So I'm just um, interested in at this point to see how many people on the line will be impacted by the change from special purpose to general purpose. So I'm just going to run our final poll. <coughs> Um, and there was quite a bit of interest in this topic at the start of the session. So I'm just interested to see um, where people feel they may be impacted. Okay, that's great. We've got over 50% voted. So I will just close the poll.
and share the results. Um, so 49% won't be impacted by the transition, um, but we have a large number on the call who are either currently prepare, preparing special purpose and will now need to do general purpose um, or will need to do general purpose for their large subsidiaries within the group. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully the information provided today will hope with this, help with the transition. Um, and on the next slide, I will just, um, we've got our BDO five step transition guide to help any clients through this process. So um, if you've previously not applied all recognition and measurement requirements, then steps one to four are critical as there are a lot of accounting policy choices um, and decisions that can be made um, which will result in different outcomes for your financial reporting. Um, and as I mentioned, you could could have a fresh start to applying the accounting standards. So it's definitely worth working through each of these steps to determine the best pathway um, if you need to transition to general purpose financial statements. And we're also running a series of virtual workshops covering the key accounting standards, which may be useful um, even if you're currently preparing general purpose financial statements, but want a refresher on some of the more complex standards, these um, virtual workshops are a great way to do that. Okay, so on to my final topic, um, which is the new AASB 1060 simplified disclosures. So linked with the removal of the reporting entity concept, we also have the new standard being AASB 1060. This standard is applicable for tier two entities as RDR is now withdrawn. It's applicable for reporting periods beginning on or after 1 July 2021. And the new standard is based on the disclosure requirements of the international standard IFRS for SMEs. Um, and the main changes from RDRs are around additional disclosure requirements for areas such as related party disclosures. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the accounting update. Um, Jane is now going to provide an update on governance and go through some very interesting case studies. So I'll hand over to you, Jane. Yeah, thanks, Ash. Um... Just thought it would be worthwhile to cover off on um, some governance issues that we've been seeing in the market and increasing in prevalence um, over the past couple of years. If we could go to the first slide, please, Ash. Thank you. Um, this is a typical governance structure that um, is well known and is also one that supported um, by the ASX corporate governance principles. And it's a structure where you have the board who's ultimately responsible. Um, you have policies, procedures, a monitoring process and reporting against um, uh, policies and procedures and performance. And that generally goes through to your committees, your audit and risk your remuneration and your nomination. Um, not all entities will have these committees. It will certainly depend on the size of the committee. Uh, and of course, not all entities will have a CEO, CFO and a Chief Risk Officer. But certainly this is a standard um, uh, governance structure where they then work between the executive, um, the various committees and the board. The executive tend to develop and implement um, policies, procedures, and a whole monitoring process around performance, um, risk management, uh, strategy, and governance as a whole, which uh, will vary, requirements will vary depending on the organisation, but certainly should be tailored. And this is one that um, this structure has been operating for some time now. However, we are still seeing um, issues where things have gone wrong. So we're just going to cover off, um, if we could go to the next slide, on areas where 
when it goes wrong, why does it go wrong when we have an actual structure in place? So these structures um, tend to, or when things go wrong, it's, it's for a number of reasons, but they tend to be around. There isn't actually a governance structure in place, or there is one that really is a um, shelf type structure and isn't one that is supported by uh, frameworks that are tailored to the organisation, such as a risk framework. Uh, it goes wrong when risks haven't been adequately identified, and this can be particularly for emerging risks. So, so concentrated on uh, performance and the performance metrics that uh, strategy in itself or the development of strategy hasn't looked and raised its head beyond the immediate um, short term and looked into um, what could possibly happen in the future. Um, pandemic is an example, although um, having worked in risk, if I'd have suggested pandemics to this degree, you know, five years ago, I'm not sure I would have got much traction there, but it just goes to show that you need to think about these issues and then um, start to consider them as they may become larger. Communication and elevation is always an issue. Things happening, um, risks are identified, uh, your operational staff may be aware of it, but there's no process in which they can communicate their concern or elevate any issues um, through the organisation. Uh, inadequate mitigation controls, and this is often because the risk framework hasn't, um, given be, hasn't been given sufficient time to be able to think about how, um, uh, um, how helpful or uh, how well formulated mitigation controls um, are and whether they're missing altogether. Accountability is always a big issue, and we certainly saw this um, in the Banking Royal Commission. So you've got to really think about um, the fact that somebody needs to be allocated as being accountable to a particular risk or risk type, um, because that then means that it will not be a diffusion of responsibility and the expectation that somebody else is looking after it or, or will take care of it. And certainly oversight. The risk frameworks may be in place, but not sufficient oversight by the board, um, the committees, or the uh, for a risk framework, for example, the CRO, in terms of um, use of the framework, communication, elevation, accountability, uh, and also if something does go wrong, then following up and seeing where the issue was, where the, the um, gap was. So if we could turn to the next, this is just an example and it's only used um, because it's the latest, but certainly many Royal Commissions and many inquiries come up with uh, similar concerns and much of them around application of um, corporate mindset to risk as well as strategy. I, just as a warning, this has come from the ABC News Online. Um, it's not directly from the interim report or the report on the Royal Commission. Um, so it should be understood uh, to be taken as media at this stage. And certainly no comment on the um, Perth Casino or the Royal Commission at this point, and which is why I've removed or blacked out names because I don't think that's relevant in the circumstances to what we're talking about today. So the first one is just an example of where policies and procedures, so an actual governance framework may have been in place, but then the mitigating controls and the thought about what policies and procedures may be required to deal with risks or to identify risks may not have been in place. The next one down to the left, is where there is a, a policy in place, a conflict of interest pol policy in place. However, the requirements in that, that policy weren't strict enough to require some sort of um, uh, reporting and elevation of conflicts. So there may have been, um, or there would be suggested to be requirements around how the conflict of interest needs to be declared, for example, in writing. Uh, to the right, um, this is one, this is an example of mitigation. 
Uh, they just thought that people like I in particular didn't appreciate what the competition was up there and I hadn't been there for many years so they were keen for me to travel to Asia and look at their facilities. You know what, this in regulation, this may very well be the case, but certainly mitigation control that could have been in places that would have been recognised by the organisation itself, um, the regulator themselves, that this um, was a gap in their particular knowledge and that, that then they manage how this knowledge um, gap be filled and mitigated against any um, perceived or actual conflicts. The next one is in the example of accountability. I maintain this view that it's someone else's role. If you have a strong accountability process in place along with your risk management, um, it's very clear whose role it is. And the final one is just a word of warning. Um, a recommended uh, waiting until the Victorian investigation had been completed. And my suggestion to you is, is that it's really not uh, worth waiting because matters outside your control can start to take control. Um, then you can't deal with them and control them as quickly as you would like to. And that may cause reputational damage for yourself. Um, next slide, please. So just a quick takeaway on this is um, start thinking about um, your organisational organizational risks, not just your financial risks, which are often uh, well managed because they have a short term measure and are far easier to manage and measure well, not so much manage, but certainly measure, um, and think, uh, broaden your thinking towards non-financial, and it's certainly out of the Banking Royal Commission we have seen, and even in, in fact, for years earlier, ASIC was talking about um, culture, and the opinion at the time was, well, how can you regulate um, culture? And that's actually preposterous. Well, the Banking Royal Commission uh, brought to the fore those issues and now there is huge expectation on non-financial risks but certainly also a broad new thinking to emerging risks and ESG as we covered off earlier is also one that um, is important to consider uh, because these are ways certainly a risk framework um, alongside your strategy are uh, um, important ways to start to protect your reputation and also the performance of your company. Thanks Ash, I think I'm finished here. Great, thanks so much Jane for your insights today, today. and um, thanks to all of you who have remained on the line for the entire webinar. Before you go, um, I've just included our upcoming webinars at BDO. Um, these are the, the schedule of BDO national webinars. So these are included on the PowerPoint presentation um, which will be sent out and includes links to register for any that are of interest to you um, and for any people on the line interested in the not-for-profit sector there is a webinar next or later this month hosted by BDO's Head of IFRS Advisory and BDO's Not-for-Profit Leader. So the links to register for that webinar are also included on your slides. <coughs> and once again, please reach out to any of our team members for any assistance um, and we'll be more than happy to help or refer you to the relevant BDO contact. Thanks again everyone for your attendance today um, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.